is Bonnie Vandermulen, training coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. On behalf of our entire Wisconsin Facets staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar is entitled Career and Technical Education, What Families of Children with IEPs Need to Know. We have a wonderful group of presenters today. I'd like to introduce Brian Keeney and Brenda Swoboda. Brian is the Southern Regional Coordinator for the Transition Improvement Grant, TIG, and covers CESA 2 and CESA 3. Brenda Swoboda is the West Regional Coordinator. She covers CESA 4, 10, and 11. Brenda and Brian will introduce our other guests to you today. So it's my pleasure today to introduce to you Brian and Brenda. Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you all for joining us today as we start to learn and talk about strategies to support students with disabilities in engagement with career and technical education. CTE is often, career and technical education is often referred to as CTE. You know, we love our acronyms in our world. It's an avenue to assist students with disabilities to develop the skills to prepare them for their future through instruction, work-based learning, and then participation in career and technical student organizations in their local school district. So changes in some statewide practice has created an emphasis on college and career readiness, and you might have also heard college, career, and then community ready uh, for all students. So before we get started, a huge thank you to FACETS for hosting us, and uh, another huge thank you to our panelists for joining us today. We will have two panels, one of a, a Mary Jo Alex and Lisa from the school family perspective and then Sarah Lincoln from DVR is going to jump in and talk about DVR support with CTE. So our intentions today is that you'll leave here with a overview of what career and technical education is and then some different options to support that in Wisconsin. But then more importantly, who to connect with in your school district district to really start asking those questions to make sure that all students are included in all options in their district. And then finally, the, the reminder that what we do in career and technical education uh, definitely increases the post-school outcomes for, for our students in Wisconsin, especially with employment and then education and training. Before we get in too far, if any of you have heard of Shelley Moore, uh, she is kind of the guru of inclusion and something that um, Shelly has done has really spoke to a lot of work that we do in Wisconsin with increasing post-school outcomes. So uh, because CTE is an inclusive practice to engage more students with disabilities and opportunities that are out there, there needs to be that kind of consistent belief in the five P's of inclusive practices. Uh, the following, or the following, the, the um, graphic here is linked to a wonderful video that we don't have time today, but you will all have this presentation. So hopefully that will open and you can watch that at your leisure. We just want to go over the kind of the five P's of inclusive practices and how CTE really fits into that. So first we want to presume, presume competence. We want to presume competence and believe that all of our students can learn deeply. And this allows us the opportunity to have high expectations for all students. Um, the place, it must be that inclusive environment. So inclusion in our classrooms, in um, our communities, especially with career and technical education. Uh, the proximity and part participation is that students learn best by being together. They learn together, grow together, same place, same time, same expectations. Um, and then the purpose is really to create that meaning, meaningful day for all students to, that really brings in that individualized piece of the IEP to make sure that we, um, that every student has the consideration of what that day will look like for them. And then the plan is to focus on that plan for person-centered uh, planning to make sure that we're providing the right supports and services to allow, the, allow all students access. So a little bit, if you're new to the world of CTE or new to the, the lingo of CTE, the overarching um, world of CTE, and then the guide here is also linked. There's, we have lots of resources in our world, uh, but it, it definitely reach out to Brian or myself at um, any point if you have questions on the resources that we're sharing today. But CTE really, uh, over the overarching umbrella is academic and technical skills, the leadership skills through career and technical skills organizations, also another acronym you'll hear referred to as CTSOs, and then those work-based learning opportunities. And then Brian's going to get in kind of the nuts and bolts of each of those, but that's your kind of starting point with the overarching umbrella of CTE. So I really like 
this slide um, because it's very simple. There's basically three pictures here. Um, there's the picture of the mine. There's the picture of career readiness um, and the jobs that we're preparing students for, meaningful employment. And then there's the overarching concept of being employment ready. So there, there really needs to be more opportunities for students with disabilities to access the relevant academic and technical skills, the courses, so to speak, that will increase their chances of success. To be employment ready and be ready to enter the workforce uh, to meet the, the demands of what's required. And it's important that there be a work experience program in place uh, that ensures that these relevant experiences um, happen prior to exiting high school. So students want the rigor, they want the opportunities that all peers have, and everybody wants to be employment ready. Uh, so when we think about CTE, uh, CTE is a component that's a catalyst to kind of move that work forward. So as you'll see in our further slides, uh, we get more in depth into that. I like this slide because it ties to our, our story that we're gonna share about Alex. Uh, sometimes all it takes is just getting students connected to CTSOs. Uh, CTSOs are kind of the, the basement level of the CTE. It's basically those career and technical skills organizations. Um, anytime we can get students involved in extracurricular activities, they're gonna, they're gonna make gains. Um, so this, um, this particular slide lists all the CTSOs that are available in most school districts. So for example, um, Skills USA is one we're gonna talk about today. And you, students learn a lot about those pre-vocational skills are really stressed in CTSOs. So students with disabilities oftentimes miss out on those when they're not involved. And when we can get them involved and we support them appropriately, uh, they do better academically and socially. Um, an extracurricular group for students in CTE pathways can further their knowledge and their skills just by simply participating. And you're going to hear some great stories from, from Alex and from Mary Joan from Lisa about how, how powerful this really is. This is a complicated slide, but I want to try to make it not so complicated. Uh, all these things that are going on on the slide are what make up work-based learning in Wisconsin. So, for example, um, I just kind of talked about those CTSOs, but in addition to those, um, we have lots of other things that can happen uh, between ninth and 12th grade for students. There's certified co-ops where students can earn certificates and credentials uh, to prepare them for the demands of industry. There's job shadows. Uh, there's opportunities to volunteer. They can do internships and externships. Uh, we have lots of schools that have service learning projects happening where kids are connecting curriculum that they're learning in the classroom to a project in the community. Um, that allows students to really feel good about what they're doing. Uh, lots of school districts now are um, having students do job shadows and they're allowing them to go and see what's happening in the workplace and then they can see if it's the right thing for them. So it allows them to navigate the systems. Uh, lots of students in agriculture are doing supervised experiences called SAEs. Um, I'm just gonna have Brenda maybe click on um, the Wisconsin Youth Apprenticeship Certificate, just so you can see that these links actually work. So if Brenda clicks on this, it's gonna bring you to the Department of Workforce Development website on youth apprenticeship programs. And you can see that there's lots of different clusters and pathways that are available to students in Wisconsin to get apprenticeships. And this is directly connected to paid work in the community. So for example, agricultural, food, and natural resources, you can see there's a whole variety of pathways here where students can connect these pathways to an employment site. And then through that process, uh, they have a student learner, learner agreement and when they get a certain number of hours of work and they meet the minimum requirements for that apprenticeship, uh, they can earn that credential. Um, and then they carry that with them to their post-secondary adult life. And that just drives home um, being career ready. 
So here's another um, graphic that shows how deeply connected uh, work-based learning in Wisconsin is to the academic and career planning process. So uh, we wanna know things, we wanna explore things, we wanna plan things, and then we want students to go. And when you start putting students into these programs that are on the left, which are very similar to the ones I just showed you on that slide, we're engaging students in that process. They feel better about themselves, they come to school, they're excited about learning and then they can connect it to their academic and career plan, which is their long term goal for this is what I want to do when I leave high school. Uh, and then we find students behave better. Uh, they they do better on tests and they graduate career and life ready and college ready. So it's it's really uh, important for parents to know this, that. These are components of the post-secondary transition plan and they're components of the academic and career plan. And Brenda's gonna kind of talk about how we connect CTE to the pre-employment transition services. So one of the things you're probably thinking is, oh, how does this all fit? And where does it fit within the college and career ready IEP, which then also at the age of 14 in Wisconsin, Wisconsin includes that post-secondary transition plan. So like Brian said, there are so many, you know, work-based learning itself has such a huge umbrella of opportunities and um, in your PTP. So if you are working with a student who has turned 14 already by law in Wisconsin, they will have a PTP as post-secondary transition plan as part of their IEP. One of the really powerful areas in that PTP to really, really engage, you know, families, agencies, and the school district and youth is the pre-employment transition services section. And that's really where you'll find um, a lot of this career and technical education can live and come to life. So one of the things that we've linked here for you is a list of those transition services, because once you see them as a whole, you can kind of see like, okay, this is where it might fit with a job shadow and we can plan for that in the PTP. We know purposeful multi-year planning increases outcomes. So the better you can plan in that PTP and include career and technical education opportunities, the better those outcomes can be for the, the your child or the students that you're working with. So I just quickly want to show the link to the full document. Definitely print this, share it with families. If you're a family, sit down and go over it with your um, child together to look at those opportunities. So there is linked. Actually, I opened it already, so I'm just going to go over here. Oh, I think I went a little too large now for the screen. This will have all of the categories that you'll see in the PTP. So you've got job exploration and counseling, work-based learning, which is kind of what we're talking about, post-secondary and higher ed, work readiness for the for social and independent living skills, work readiness for the community, and then self-advocacy or instruction and self-advocacy. So inside of that, it really breaks them down to what services can we provide to our students that increase these outcomes. So again, this is a long document for you to probably re uh, reflect upon later, but just wanted you to know that that is there. And that's really how we bridge the world of inclusive education and fine tune and create those indiv individualized plans for our students. So I am going to let Brian kind of take it over because I think the next group of presenters are really going to be able to tell you how this comes to life. So this is a, this is something that we really thought about um, long and hard when Brenda and I were planning this presentation. We really wanted to have a parent perspective, um, a student perspective, and then a school perspective. So I am super excited that we have all three. Um, we we did have a little bit of technical difficulty so um our student his name is alex grant uh, he's a senior in high school at new berlin school district he's joining us through lisa's speakerphone and lisa brazelton is an educator at new berlin school district she's the transition coordinator um, so she connects the students that she serves to all these wonderful opportunities and and then we have um we have mom uh, on live with us as well. That's Mary Jo Grant. Um, and Mary Jo is going to talk about the importance of keeping our parents engaged in this process and keeping them informed and making sure that they're, they're all smiles and they're excited about their son or daughter's journey. So uh, it's my pleasure to 
introduce Alex Grant and his mother, Mary Jo, um, as well as Lisa Brazelton. Uh, they're all from the New Berlin School District, and we're going to have a conversation with them about their experiences with CTE. So I am just going to get going. I'm going to let Alex share some things about his journey. Um, Alex is college bound. Um, you can see here by the graphics on the screen, Alex has developed a passion for woodworking. He's New Berlin has a thing called um, New Berlin Excellence. It's part of their school district's mantra, and that arrow is pointing to excellence, and Alex is achieving excellence right now. Uh, he is very active in Skills USA. Um, I'll let him talk about that. And then he's really passionate about science. So those are all things that he discovered about himself through CTE. So a lot of power there. So I'm just going to kind of start with Mary Jo. Um, I'm going to ask questions, and we're going to let the parents uh the student and the educator kind of just share their relevant experiences so mary joe before we get into the success of alex with new berlin and skills usa um tell us a little bit about alex as a child and what really makes you proud right now well thank you for having me on um thank you lisa um Lisa and Alex have um, a special uh, relationship too. They go way back to when um, Alex, I think was in seventh grade, Lisa, um, was in your class and he was helping some of your very special needs um, students and he volunteered that. Um, and I um, think in eighth grade, he can verify this, um, he, it was, uh, a teacher came up to him and, and introduced Skills USA to him and said, hey, you know, would you like to join? Um, he was so, you know, I guess hesitant, but then once he started finding out more about it, he really was stoked about it. It was um, just really an awesome um, opportunity. He was with um, team the team, he was with other students um, that were striving for um, just different things. Um, as, a, as a child, Alex was always on the go, constantly on the go. He, at two years old, would say, out chide, out chide, you know, he couldn't quite pronounce that um, very well. It was, it, it was cute, but um, it, was, it was exhausting because I was always running around trying to find him. <laughs> Um, or catch up to him. Um, he was uh, he was later diagnosed with ADHD. I had no idea, um, and I remember my my father saying that you know oh that one's going to be a handful, and I had no idea what that meant. Um, but yes, yes, running around and um, looking, uh, trying to catch up with him. He has um, come. So far, so far, I'm just absolutely um, so proud of him. Uh, he's a self starter. He's a go getter, um, and I think that Skills USA really played a big, big part in that. Well, thank you, Mary Jo. I can I can just tell by the way you're talking about him that you're super proud. Is it is it snowing there? Yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> you can see I, that. Yeah. I see yeah. It out the window. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And uh, we hope that Alex continues to uh, impress you and um, that you're, you continue your, your proud streak. And I have no doubt that he will. Um, Alex, can you? I just want to make sure that you can hear me through the speakerphone. You're kind of like uh, through the, you're almost. Uh, like you're connected via Bluetooth. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. You're, yeah. Alex, what what really helped you get connected to CTE involvement? Uh, CTE is a process; it's not one thing. Uh, so, what made that magic kind of happen for you? Well, it it, it took a lot. Um, when I got here to New Berlin schools, um, was fortunate enough to meet a teacher who ran uh, a skills USA club. And, you know, at that time I had no idea 
what was going on. I was moving from new school that I was fairly new. Um, you know, I didn't really know what was going on, trying to get used to things. And um, they had this club in, um, in seventh grade. I followed it. And uh, in eighth grade, I officially joined Skills USA. And uh, that's where the match, you know, really began. Um, gave me a sense of place, you know, somewhere where I could go, have fun, talk to talk to people who'd become now life, you know, lifelong friends. Um, hopefully, lifelong friends. I mean, we're you know, we still talk here and there, and I've got the opportunities to travel with Skills USA. I was down in uh, Kentucky, and I met a lot of cool people from around the United States, and you know, I still talk to these people every day, and uh, even people from up north in Wisconsin and from all over. And so that is really where, you know, the magic started and it has come so far. Yeah, it kind of catapulted a lot of other really impressive things for you. You took some high rigorous courses, some dual enrollment classes that yes. maybe you wouldn't yeah. maybe you maybe you wouldn't have took those classes without that connection. Yeah, it got me uh involved in those CTE classes uh, with construction and WCTC uh, based classes, um, getting those college, early college credits, you know, and that got me in. I finished construction at our school. I made it to construction two this year and uh, did construction one as a sophomore. So I, I, I do enjoy carpentry as a great hobby of mine. And uh, later on, I found a passion for science and started taking higher level science classes, intro classes to science. I've taken a lot of science classes. And so I really enjoy science. And that's, uh, I don't know if, you know, without Skills USA, that, that would have uh, led me in that direction. Yeah, I could, I could listen to that for hours, Alex. There's no doubt about that. I, I'm glad that we got connected. Uh, you have a powerful story. So, Lisa, what what growth have you seen in Alex from middle school through high school, and and what do you attribute some of that growth to? So, I met Alex when he was in seventh grade. Um, at the time, I was teaching in uh, in the local in our high school, and I got a phone call asking if uh, if we could if I could work with this young man because he was just not able to be successful in study hall and some of the quieter classes um, that he was being very disruptive that he was really having a challenging time um, so alex and i met and like mary joe mentioned he was just a natural at working with our students with most significant special needs alex has such a gentle heart. He has so much empathy towards others. It's a really neat thing to watch. And he really understands that regardless of disability, uh, we're all peers. And so it was, it was a really amazing experience for me to be able to watch that as well as the other students. Um, doesn't change the fact though that Alex in seventh grade was lost. He was scared and his behaviors were really interfering with his ability to interact appropriately with peers and to access his education. Um, what I see as the big catalyst for Alex's success is his access to CTE. Um, starting with skills you say, I mean, he hit the ground running. Alex, what did you, what did, what, with your birdhouse, so that was your first big project with Skills USA. What medal did you take with that? First place. Was it just like a, a local level first place? Uh, this was a uh, state level uh, down in Madison at the Aligned Energy Center, and uh, that yeah, that really that really threw me off. I, that was my very first competition. I didn't do any of the district or regional competitions, and I. Decided I want to do woodworking display. They gave me uh, a couple months to do all the drafting for it and all the, you know, all the drawings for it and uh, blueprints and stuff. And then I, you know, started building it, photographed it along the way, and uh, made this made a portfolio for it. And 
I took first place for that uh, in, in eighth grade. So for those of you who are not able to see this birdhouse, I feel sorry for you. It, it truly is a work of art. It's an amazing piece of art. Um, and again, so this is his first attempt and Alex was so, so successful with that. And that success really led to the confidence that a an insecure middle school child needed. Um, and Alex was able then to take that one time success and just keep building on it and building on it. Um, <clears throat> he continued to have amazing success in Skills USA. Uh, we've just seen some some really awesome things come out of that. But then that success in Skills USA enabled Alex to have that confidence to try some of the things again, like that sciences that he had interest in but he wasn't quite sure that this was something that he could do. Um, and so this translated into increasing and increasing uh, levels of academic success, which again, kept building on that. And that then transferred into his ability to really start seeing that social emotional growth. He was really able to start bridging past some of those um, behaviors that he was exhibiting and really building friendships, building um, the skills to be active and um, engaged in his learning process. Again, it just all kept sewing together for him, which has just been fantastic. So not only has Alex participated in those CTSOs, but he's participated in our CTE classes. Um, he's taken AP classes, he's taken college level classes now, which is incredible growth from a young man who in seventh grade was doing somersaults down the study hall main aisle. Well, Lisa, it's obvious uh, that, you know, you do, you do a great job at what you're doing, uh, you know, getting students to reach their potential and Alex sure has. And uh, we, we really want to make sure we leave some time for uh, Sarah Lincoln to talk about how DVR connects to CTE, because that's a relevant, very um, important topic. So if we could wrap up Mary Jo, Lisa and Alex, maybe just a, a little advice, something really quick. Um, Lisa, I'll start with you. Just advice for families. I really feel so strongly about the importance of inclusion for students with, with disabilities and CTE. Um, I would strongly recommend that parents educate themselves about what the opportunities are in their schools or school districts and have those important conversations within the IEP team itself and possibly even with building administrators on how they can work together to build these opportunities for our students so that everybody can build towards life, lifelong success. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Alex, any advice for parents? Um, what I, what I would say is um, always compromise, make do with what you have, you know, if, you know, if your student is struggling or if you see a student struggling, offer any extracurricular activities that might interest them. You know, I was lucky enough that it, I, I got, I found what I, what I liked on, on the first round. Others might not. That's where that, you know, don't give up, compromise, you know, make do with what you have and you know, you will, you will eventually find something or something along the lines that will make, you know, that student happy and uh, hopefully grow strong, you know, academically and, you know, outside of school, you know, uh, if I haven't found skills yesterday, I don't know where I'd be right now, you know, it's that one, you know, it's that one leap that can change everything for a student. That's so awesome. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Mary Jo, just to wrap us up, we're from parent to parent. Um, you know, try it. If it's, you know, not for you, at least you tried it. But I bet that you would find some things because there's such a range of offerings here for um, students that I would just say, just try. Sign up and, and, and you know, just try it. Two, two powerful words for an IEP meeting. Why not? You know, why not? And uh, this is a perfect example of uh, 
what we wanted. So thank you so much to the three of you. And uh, this is probably not the last time we're gonna lean on you. So be prepared for what's next. All right, Brenda. Awesome, well, thank you guys so much. And just a reminder that we will have more Q&A after Sarah goes. So Mary Jo, Alex and Lisa are gonna stick with us. So if you have specific questions from for them, uh, they'll still be here. So next we're going to kind of segue to Sarah Lincoln from the Division on Vocational Rehabilitation. We initially reached out to Sarah and asked her to talk about how DVR can support youth apprenticeship. And we very quickly realized like that um, DVR is, for, for people that were joining us, we also wanted to have a little bit of a background on DVR. So if you're just hearing about what DVR can do, we wanted you to walk away with kind of some walking knowledge with that. But also they really pr promote and support so much of what we're talking about today. It's not just youth apprenticeship. So Sarah's gonna take it over and uh, talk a little bit about DVR and the support <coughs> with um, CTE. Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Sarah Lincoln, and I am a program and policy analyst with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. So I'm going to give you just a few slides of some DVR 101, just to give you some background in case you're not familiar with our program. So uh, DVR, again, it's the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. We are a state agency located under the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development, or DWD. And our main goal is to develop occupational talents of individuals with disabilities. Our funding is a split funding uh, between state and federal funds. So 78.7% is federal funding and then 21.3% is a required match that is our state general purpose revenue dollars. So we're very fortunate in Wisconsin that our legislature uh, always meets that full maximum match uh, so that we can pull down as much federal dollars as is possible. So our mission is to assist individuals with disabilities in obtaining, maintaining, or improving their employment. Next slide. So um, just a little bit about how to get involved with DVR. Uh, DVR, it has a process where you fill out a referral form and then you go through an application process. So DVR is an eligibility-based program. And if you are a student with a disability and you have an IEP or a 504 plan, or you don't have either one of those plans and you may have a physical disability that doesn't require you to have a 504 plan or an IEP, um, we still recommend that you go through the referral process with DVR to see if we can help. So we do recommend that high school students with a disability apply to DVR at least two years before they exit school. So if you're gonna exit around age 18, we recommend your referral at 16. If you're staying through 21, uh, then we say um, it's best to be referred at age 19. However, uh, if you have employment needs uh, prior to two years before you exit, a DVR can be brought in. Uh, to provide information about DVR without you going through the referral process during an IEP meeting uh, if they are invited. Uh, so we can do that at any time. We can come in and discuss the services that we can provide to you when you're ready for uh, community integrated employment. If a student is under the age of 18 or they're 18 or over and they have a guardian, we do require uh, a guardian's signature on all of our documents. So the referral uh, to apply can be done online, by mail, or in person. Uh, and so the majority of our referrals right now are happening through our online process. Uh, and so I can, I can share with you the link in order to do that online. Next slide, please. So who is eligible? To be eligible for DVR services, you must have a documented medical or psychological ability that presents a barrier to employment. So as I said, you don't necessarily have to be a student that's receiving special ed services in your school, um, but you do have to have a documented disability that creates barriers to work. So DVR staff will work with the applicant to gather any written documentation and information um, that we may need in order to determine your eligibility. 
So oftentimes when we're working with schools, that medical documentation is already gathered by the school and we can get it um, through an IEP. And so we just sign a release of information or we have the, the student and their parent do that and we can get information from the school. Uh, we also can pay for any kind of evaluation that may be necessary in order to get that medical documentation. Uh, so that is something that DVR um, can help pay for and can help with a person uh, scheduling that. And so uh, that is kind of how that process goes. So we gather the information, um, we then determine if you are eligible, and then I believe the next slide tells you um, how we decide what order you're gonna be served. So DVR is a eligibility-based program, and we are required by federal law to serve those with the most significant disabilities first. So when you come through the application and referral process, we will assess you based on seven different areas that are related to work. So you can see them on the screen. They are mobility, communication, self-care, self-direction, interpersonal skills and acceptance, work tolerance, and work skills. So as long as you come up with a barrier in one of these seven different areas related to work, um, you will receive DVR services. Now, based on how many of these you have, will determine if you are in category one, who is the very most significant, category two, who is a little less significant, and category three. Currently, DVR is serving, uh, is immediate service for categories one and two. And if you are in category three, um, right now, you are sitting on a wait list um, with what has been happening with COVID-19. Uh, our referrals have been down, and so we are activating people in Category 3 in intermittent chunks. So uh, that's the first time that DVR has been able to do that in many, many years. Um, so we're, we're really pleased to be able to do that, to serve as many people as we can. Next slide, please. So key practices for transition. Brenda shared with you uh, that slide where they talked about pre-employment transition services. And so I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but the first thing is, is to invite DVR to an IEP. Again, I mentioned we can provide technical assistance about our services prior to referral. Um, but once the individual is a DVR consumer, uh, we like to be invited to the IEP meetings so that we can make sure that the IEP and then there is a plan developed as a DVR consumer uh, called an IPE, which is an individualized plan for employment. Those two plans really should be complementary and we should be working as the local school and the DVR counselor together to ensure that our services are supporting that student to, to make sure that they reach their, their best potential possible. So we do have DVR counselors that are assigned to every school around the state. And prior to COVID-19, we had uh, regular school hours in the majority of our public schools. And so we are slowly working our way back to doing that. Um, in the interim though, we have joined IEP meetings virtually or on the phone, or we have been in touch with a special ed teacher and parent and student, maybe outside of an IEP meeting. Um, but ju just I wanted to really emphasize the fact that we are continuing to provide services even during this time where we're not necessarily in the school districts. Next slide, please. So helpful tools for transition. Brenda went over the five pre-eds categories and actually when you're talking about your IEP, they split the fourth one into um, independent living skills in the community and then independent living skills at home. I believe that's correct, right Brenda? So there actually are maybe six categories in the IEP. But in DVR world, we combine those two into the fourth one. So uh, you also heard earlier in the presentation about student work-based learning activities and how those can be really essential to the success of a student. Um, and so DVR partners with school districts in order to provide a lot of those services like 
um, job shadows, like temporary work experiences. Um, we also offer uh, the Project Search program in many different areas around the state. That's not a statewide service everywhere, um, but it is expanding uh, and we are able to offer that service. Um, we also like to partner on youth apprenticeship. Uh, we do have a new focus going forward, a DVR does specifically to CTE. Um, we are going to be um, really putting a strong focus on that uh, during state fiscal year 2022 and 23. And that just means starting in July of this year. So state fiscal year starts July of this year. Um, we are really going to be putting a focus on supporting our consumers, our students, in participating in those career and technical education courses. In fact, DVR applied for a federal grant, our fingers crossed that we get it, um, where we're really gonna hire staff from the DVR end to focus on CTE-related courses in the school, and then using DVR funds to help enhance those experiences that they have through CTE, so the student can be as prepared as they possibly can when they graduate, if they wanna go on to post-secondary training or if they are really ready to just jump right into community-based work. So um, a lot of the, the things that Brenda mentioned as far as the key services in their IEP, DVR helps and works collaboratively with the school to provide those as well. So I'll give you an example. If a student is doing a temporary work experience in the community, um, the school supports them while they are in school. So during the school day, if the student goes away, leaves the school grounds to do a temporary work experience. Now, if that student wants to work nights or on the weekends and they require some support on that job, then DVR can bring in their funds to help enhance that service even more for a student. So really, um, the, the local schools and the DVR transition counselors, really uh, the best practice is for them to have open communication. Our IEP and IPE should be collaborative plans or, uh, along with the academic and career plan uh, to really all wrap around the student to, to be as supportive as we can to ensure that they're successful. Next slide, please. So again, I mentioned this a few times, but a specific slide, the IPE is the Individualized Plan for Employment. And really it just includes all the services that DVR will help the student with in order to reach their employment goal. Next slide. So really the end goal for DVR, and I do believe it's probably the end goal for most of the, of the individuals that we're talking to today, um, is to make sure that these students leave with a full or part-time job, earning at least minimum wage or higher uh, in a job that offers wages and benefits similar to those earned by those without disabilities performing the same work. We also want them to have jobs that provide equal access to advancement opportunities. Uh, these jobs need to be found in the community as integrated as possible and that the setting is uh, where an employee with a disability interacts with people with disabilities and without disabilities. So all of that is called competitive integrated employment. It's how we define it uh, for DVR. And so that really is the goal for, for any student that we're working with is to make sure they're in the community working at their highest potential possible, earning as much as they possibly can. So DVR is a short-term program. So once we work with you, develop your plan, you have those work experiences, uh, you go out in the community, you do a temporary work experience, uh, maybe you go on and DVR helps provide funding for a post-secondary training program or a college or a technical program. Um, once you are solid in your job and you are considered stable, um, we will follow you for at least 90 days, which means we'll check in, we'll do a 30 day, every 30 day contact, make sure you don't require any more of our services. And then um, we will close your case. Now, when we say close your case, that doesn't mean that you can't come back to us at any time that you need us. Uh, DVR doesn't have any rules about how often you want to reapply. So let's say you're out in the community, you're doing great, something happens, your disability is exacerbated, uh, you lose your job, and then you decide, you know what, I wanna do a career change and I need more training. Uh, you can come back and reapply for DVR. 
for those individuals that have the most significant disabilities and they are receiving supported or customized employment, um, the 90-day time frame doesn't start until they do a transition to long-term support. We want to make sure that that consumer doesn't drop off, their supports don't drop off after they leave DVR. So we follow along uh, to make sure that they are going to receive services in the long term uh, before we're, we're able to close them. And again, they can apply any, reapply anytime. Next slide, please. These are just some resources. Uh, DVR does have a statewide transition action and resource team. Uh, and there is a link here that will tell you about the counselors that are on that team. And then I did mention that we do have a transition counselor that is assigned to every school, every public high school in the state. Uh, if you go to that link, uh, you can find your school and then you can find the um, contact information for that counselor. So, awesome. Thank you for going to the link, Brenda. And that's all I have for DVR. And I'm open for any questions, although I think maybe it's open for all questions now, right? Yeah, so I know Brian was going to try to slip in a picture of Alex since you weren't able to see him. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, we're going to open it now for all questions. I think we went a little backwards in our slides, but um, I don't know, Bonnie, if there are questions in the chat or anything specific we can ask of our panelists. Actually, I do have several questions. Um, the first question that we have came in a while ago, and that is, can you explain a little bit more about what an externship is? Yeah, Brian, do you wanna take that one? I think that was on your slide with the different options under the workplace learning umbrellas. Yeah, so uh, an externship is, uh, it's fairly similar to an internship with the exception that sometimes extern externships are an agreement between an employer and a school district where um, there's a stipend in pay or it might not be um, a paid opportunity, but there's an exchange for some other benefit for the student. So it's, it's very similar to an internship. Okay, and if somebody needed some more information, they can just contact you about that? Yes. Okay. Our next question is, is Skills USA available at all schools? I have not heard about it in Arcadia. Probably the best thing to do there is to either dive deeper into the school district's website. Um, not all school districts have some of these programs because they might not have an advisor. Um, the key to a program is that there needs to be a teacher in the building or another staff member that would would serve as the advisor um, and regulate the activity and make sure there's a budget. So you could talk to somebody in the CTE department as well, and they would know. Usually building so if, principals would know too. If that program is not available, are there other ways to access the Skills USA program? Possibly uh, a neighboring school district might have it. And if there were some agreements in place, that might be an opportunity to engage in Skills USA, but I'm not positive on that one. But that would be worth looking into. Okay. Is it best to work through the school for DVR or to contact DVR directly? Uh, so that is completely up to the student. Uh, oftentimes we have um, the teachers help the student fill out the referral form, or if a family and a student want to do it all on their own, they can do that too. So there really is no wrong door. Either way, either way is great. So as a follow-up to that question, if a parent knows that their son or daughter has disabilities, before the age of 14, can they call DVR to talk with them about what they think might be necessary and when their child gets to be 14, put in a request at that time? Sure, absolutely. But again, I, I do want to, to stress too that there are a lot of the same services, the pre-employment transition services that schools provide. And so it really, 
Uh, I would recommend that the parent and student talk with their special ed teacher. And sure, we can bring in a transition counselor to provide information about what DVR can do for you. Um, but the school really too, there's a lot of things that they can do to help the student get ready and, and work collaboratively with DVR in order to make that happen. Um, as I mentioned, we really recommend the two years prior to exit, prior to exiting high school before coming to DVR. But if there are needs and we can all work collaboratively to make it happen, we can do that too. Are there other services beside DVR that a student or a family member might look into um, before they exit school? So I can take that one. I, yes, and I, I don't know the best way to answer that. That really can be driven by that post-secondary transition plan. That's where you'll find the conversation about outside agencies. Um, county to county, what uh, agencies are titled, what they're called can be very different. So I would suggest starting with a conversation with um, your child's case manager or IEP manager just to see locally what you can access. So, you know, there are so many agencies and supports, supports out there, but it's starting with that conversation of what supports are needed to then match some of the local agencies and providers. I know DVR is, um, when I was still in the classroom, was a huge help if in knowing some of the local like providers. And um, so it's having that conversation as an IEP team. And I know that's a very broad answer, but it, that's really where you, where you start that conversation about outside agencies. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to draw people's attention to the picture that was yeah. put up because I would presume that must be Alex. That is, that is, uh, the picture on the left is Alex's birdhouse uh, that he made when he got his uh, special award. And you can see he's in his, um, it almost looks like he won the masters. He's got yeah. his jacket on. That's a green jacket for the masters, but Alex has on his red, his red jacket, you can see he looks really proud and sporting <laughs> his medal around his neck. And that, that birdhouse is pretty impressive, Alex. It sure is. Um, if Alex is still on, we have a question for him. And that question is, when uh, before you got involved in some of these activities with school and, and with the specific programs that you were talking about, what was the hardest thing for you in school? What what did you struggle with? Um, it was pretty uh, pretty hard moving from school districts, um, finding new friends in the school district. I went to Poplar Creek, which was our elementary school, and uh, met a neighbor who actually lived, you know, right behind us. Um, it was a great friend of mine right now, but it was really hard for me to, you know out there and meet new friends you know I had you know a lot of friends you know I've lost along the way and um, I've kept a lot of the good, good friends um, from my previous school district and I uh, have gained friends from the school district that I'm at now New Berlin and uh, but that was definitely the hardest part finding you know a place where you know I fit in you know Okay, thank you. I think that's all the questions that we have for our panelists right now. Do any of you have any closing comments or statements that you'd like to make? So one of the things that Brian and I wanted to make sure that people knew was that this is, you know, this is a process. We can walk away and make this sound really easy, but it really starts with conversations and sometimes knowing the questions to ask, um, especially, um, when um, you're talking about a world that you might not be as familiar with. So for, for example, me, Brian is way more familiar with CTE and all the opportunities than I am. So I go to him a lot, but we wanted to put some questions together just so you'd have a slide to go back to, you know, start with, you know, this somebody in the school district to see like, what are the extracurricular activities that are tied to career and technology, career and technical education? 
you know, who can you get in touch with? Who can support, if you're a family and a student, who can support that journey and finding a fit? Because that's just as important too as, as anything else we do is making sure that it it's something that can, like with Alex, drive a passion, which might then drive future planning. So we just put some slides or some questions together here um, of some of those questions that can support that global conversation. Um, and then we did also, Brian's going to talk a little bit about, we're going to end with the dignity of risk. But before we do that, I'm going to jump ahead. We also, there's so much out there. That's why reach out. Um, we're always on the other end of our emails or phones, but we put out, put some few, if you're visual learners like us, there are some videos on specific, um, uh, like youth apprenticeship, there's a CTSO video. So if you wanted to visually see what some of this looks like, there's some additional resources there too. And then Brian was going to wrap us up with one of his favorite slides. Yeah, besides the the Shelley Moore, um, the five Ps, I really like this dignity of risk slide uh, because I mean Alex even said it numerous times. This is a leap of faith, right? You you either do it or you don't, and if you don't, um, then you don't know what you're missing. And the dignity of risk is defined as the concept of affording a person the right or the dignity to take reasonable risks and not stripping them of that right. Uh, if we impede this, we're actually suffocating personal growth, self-esteem and overall quality of life. And we see this, it's very evident. Um, this isn't invisible. Uh, it's very visible when students struggle to self-advocate. Um, Alex today struggled to get on a computer to be live with us and it didn't rattle him at all. He just decided that he was gonna do it through Lisa on a speakerphone and it worked beautifully. So that's a perfect example of taking that risk. You know, I can't get on on a computer, so I'm gonna try and access in, in some other fashion. That's a, I don't know of a better of example than one that just literally happened today. So I appreciate everyone's time and Brenda, I really appreciate you uh, doing this with me. And um, Bonnie, we always appreciate being part of uh, Wisconsin fastest webinars and especially when it's a topic that this isn't going to go away. CTE is going to be a huge topic next year and the year after. So this is oh. great stuff. Thank you everybody. Thank you Brian, Brenda, Lisa, Alex, Mary Jo and Sarah for joining us today. Um, we really, really appreciate the candidness of this presentation and the fact that we were able to get everybody's perspective. Um, so thank you again. This will conclude our webinar. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Please be reminded that Wisconsin Facets has over 100 trainings and webinars for the year 2021. Please feel free to check out our website calendar and register for any of those trainings that you may be interested in. Also, please watch for the short evaluation that will be coming your way after today's live presentation. Please remember that those evaluations are really important for us because it will help us to plan for our future trainings. Have a nice day, everybody. Stay well. Thank you again to all our presenters. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.